Hello and welcome to the chapter 14.3 video lecture on motion in space. So last time near the end of 14.2, we actually already introduced this topic. We introduced it in the context of the meaningfulness of derivatives and integrals of vector valued functions. So for example, we know that the derivative of velocity is acceleration and its integral is position. And today we continue that line of discussion. First, let's see geometrically why these things are true. So here in black is the position function, R of t, the trajectory of some particle in space. And here are the velocity vectors at each point. Velocity is the derivative of position. If we imagine two very close position vectors, so that's a difference over a time dt, then the difference between those divided by dt will more and more approach the exact velocity at that point as dt approaches zero. And similarly, the derivative of the velocity function is acceleration. So here two very close velocity vectors. Their difference is a little vector like that. And if you divide by dt, that's dividing by a very small number that will stretch it out into difference in velocity over difference in time, which is the definition of acceleration. You can see that this looks like a parabola, and indeed it is. If you have a constant acceleration on a particle that has an initial velocity in, an, in a direction orthogonal to that acceleration, then it will form a parabolic trajectory, as will be seen. So position, velocity, speed, and acceleration. And in particular, a new concept here is speed. So first, the, let the position of an object moving in 3D space be given by R of t with its x, y, and z components of position for t positive. Then we know that the velocity is the derivative of position, which is the derivative of the respective components. And what is the difference between velocity and speed? Well, speed is a scalar. Speed does not care about direction. So the speed is the magnitude of velocity, which is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components, as always, just definition of magnitude. And the acceleration, that's the difference in velocity per difference in time, which is the derivative of velocity, but, but, but velocity is already the derivative of position. So acceleration is thus the second derivative of position. So for example, going around in a circle at a constant rate, constant rate is how we might describe it in informal English. But in this case, what it really means is a constant speed due to rate possibly meaning velocity. Then the speed, the magnitude of the velocity vector is constant. So you can see that here are the different velocity vectors. The, vel the velocity vectors are, change are changing, but the speed is always constant. So for example, Earth going around the sun always a constant speed, but our velocity is changing. So the velocity, which is speed plus direction, is constantly changing. So let's apply what we've learned to find the velocity and speed of an example like this as a function of time. So our canonical parameterization of the circle, you recall, is cosine t comma sine t. We're just adding a three here, which makes it going around a circle of radius three. Let's find its velocity function vector as a function of time first. Well, its velocity as a function of time, that's the derivative of position as a function of time. And taking the derivative of each component, derivative of cosine is negative three sine, and derivative of sine is cosine. So that would be its velocity. 
Its speed, on the other hand, and you can see that these are constantly changing. Its speed, on the other hand, that is the magnitude of the velocity. And that would be the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. OK, so let's factor out that 3 squared. We have 9 times sine squared plus cosine squared. The minus, of course, goes away under the squaring. And sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we just have square root of 9 is 3. So that's the constant speed here. Magnitude of the velocity is always constant. Now, let's find its acceleration as a function of time. Well, we know that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. We already found that the velocity vector of color code is this. So the derivative of that, derivative of sine is cosine. So we have negative three cosine. And derivative of cosine is negative sine. So we have negative three sine of t is the acceleration as a function of time. Now, a straight line, constant velocity trajectory, straight line motion is given generally by r of t is x naught plus a t, where this x naught, y naught, z naught is the initial position, and a, b, c is the velocity vector, comma, y naught plus b t, z naught plus c t. And notice that each of these is like the standard equation for a line. It's like your b plus mx, mx plus b. And this just generalizes that. We can think of this as what well, this actually is our line. So expanding this out, this is our, this becomes x naught, y naught, z naught plus t times a, b, c. And in our former, or former notation, that is, our initial position plus t times our direction, our vector direction of movement. So it's like, so here's x naught, y naught, z naught, and our velocity. And we can get to different points depending upon how far we stretch that velocity, forming a straight line. We're moving along with that straight line. So the longer one would be, for example, 2b. So let's find the velocity and speed of a particle whose trajectory is given by the above and its acceleration. So first, the velocity. That's the derivative of position. And the derivative of each component, so x naught is a constant. So it goes away. Derivative of a constant is 0. And derivative of a times t is just a. Similarly, y naught is a constant. Its derivative is 0. Derivative of dt is b. And similarly for the z component. OK, while well, the speed, that's the magnitude of velocity which is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. And that is also constant. Constant velocity, constant speed. And the acceleration, that is the derivative of velocity. But the velocity is constant. Each component is constant. And derivative of a constant is 0. And in our vector notation, the 0 vector is denoted this way, 0 with a vector over it. Or in the book, it might it's typically a bold 0 is how the book does it. 
And indeed, moving in a straight line at a constant speed, that means you are not changing your velocity at all. So that's a zero acceleration, zero change in velocity. Now, our earlier example, this guy, this guy was moving in a circle. And let's talk about circle, circular motion more generally. So circular motion generally has, has a relation between position, velocity, and acceleration vectors looking like this. So the position vector is always orthogonal to the velocity vector. And the velocity vector is in turn always orthogonal to the acceleration vector, which is thus parallel to the position vector. But the acceleration vector is pointing inward, indicating that the change in position necessary, sorry, paint, change in velocity necessary is always moving in. So over here, the velocity vector, for example, is that. So we have this change in velocity moving down, and that is always pointing inward, inward in the circle. And circular motion can occur not just on the xy axis, but it could be on the xz axis or even at in a skew thing, skew to all axes. So it does not need to be parallel to an axial plane. But no matter what its position, these relationships must hold, in which R is orthogonal to V, and then V is orthogonal to the, to the acceleration. So here's a way to tell in general if a path describes a circular motion centered at the origin. So if it's circular motion centered at the origin, that means that the position vectors must be of constant magnitude. So let R describe a path on which those position vectors are of constant magnitude. Then that means that R dot V must be zero, which means that the position vector and velocity vectors are orthogonal for all times. And in fact, this is an if and only if condition. If R dot V is zero for all T, then that means that it describes circular motion. So here's the derivation. First, if R has constant magnitude, as in this picture, let's prove that R dot V is always zero. So constant magnitude, well, the magnitude squared is by definition essentially R dot R, so that must be equal to C. And then differentiating both sides, derivative of C is zero, and the derivative of R dot R is by the dot product rule, the product rule applied to dot products that we learned. That's r prime dot r plus r dot r prime. Dot product is commutative. You can swap the order. Something plus itself is two times that thing. And that's still equal to zero. And that two doesn't matter. You can just divide both sides by two. And r prime is by definition v. So that means that v dot r is zero for all t. And the dot product is zero, if and only if they're orthogonal, as we learned. So that means that R and V are orthogonal for all P. And notice that this whole thing is reversible, hence the if and only if condition, this being sufficient to prove that it is circular motion on a well circle centered at the origin, regardless of its skewedness to any axial plane. You can begin with this, follow this whole derivation up, integrate that, you get that this must be constant, and therefore R is of constant magnitude, and Thus, it is a circle. So let's do an example. Say a particle moves with position vector r of t is 3 cosine t plus 5 sine t plus 4 cosine t. So clearly, each of these components varies as a function of t, and this will not be parallel to any axial plane. However, let's show that this trajectory lies on a sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. So that means taking each of these components and squaring them and adding them together and showing that that lies on a sphere, i.e. satisfies this equation. Okay, so 
x squared, that's 3 cosine t squared, y squared, that's 5 sine t squared, z squared, that's 4 cosine t squared, And that is 9 cosine t squared plus 25 sine squared t plus 16 cosine squared t, t. Okay, we can add together the two cosine squared, 16 plus 9. Is 25. Factor out the 25, and we have our lovely Pythagorean trigonometric identity, which we know is equal to 1. So this is just 25. So therefore, this old guy is equal to 25. And we know that that is r squared. And therefore, this lies on a sphere of radius 5. Okay, so it lies on a sphere of radius 5, but that doesn't necessarily prove that it is a circular trajectory. It could be wibbly wobbling around that sphere. So it turns out here that it is indeed a circular trajectory, but we need to prove that. And also, show that if we want to show that it's a constant uh, circular trajectory, constant speed, we need to show that its speed is constant. Well, the speed, that is the magnitude of velocity. The velocity here, taking the derivatives of each of these, derivative of 3 cosine is negative 3 sine, Derivative of 5 sine is 5 cosine, and derivative of 4 cosine is negative 4 sine. Okay, and taking the magnitude of velocity, that would be the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. And a very similar thing as before will happen, we'll get a uh, Pythagorean trigonometric identity. I'm going to uh, jump straight from here to here. In other words, immediately gather the terms for the sake of saving space. So here we have the sine squared. That's the sine squared. Coefficients are 9 and 16. So that is 25 sine squared. And here we have a 25 cosine squared. OK, and that is 25 times our usual sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1, as always. And root 25 is 5. OK, so good. That is a constant speed. of five. And let's actually prove that this is indeed circular motion. So let's prove that it is circular motion. OK, so we know that this will be circular about the origin if and only if r dot v is 0. So that's if and only if the r and 
v vectors are always orthogonal. So let's compute that. So R, that's three cosine T comma five sine T comma four cosine T. V, the derivative, that's minus three sine T comma five cosine T comma minus four sine t. Okay, and computing that dot product, we have three cosine times minus three sine is minus three cosine t sine t plus five sine times five cosine is plus 25 sine t cosine t. Okay, plus four cosine times minus four sine is minus 16 cosine t sine t. Okay, and adding these together, we have minus 9 plus 25 minus 16. All of the trig things are identical, so we can just gather the coefficients, and that is 0. Okay, and that shows that r of t dot v of t is always 0. So we have shown that it is of constant circular motion. And indeed, therefore, it looks like that path going in a circle of radius 5. OK, now, another main topic of motion in space is motion in a gravitational field. Isaac Newton showed that force is mass times acceleration, as he defined this very useful notion of force. And we don't really need to know this in the class. It's just a nice physical application. And to solve for a trajectory of an object subject to some accelerated force, what we need to do is integrate the acceleration to get velocity. and Integral of acceleration will have that plus c, as always with integrals. In this case, a plus a constant vector. So then what we need to do is solve for the arbitrary constants so that it is equal to the initial velocity. So we must be given the initial velocity to have any clue of what the velocity is as a function of time. And then once we have the velocity as a function of time, then we integrate that to get position. And once again, we'll have a plus c, and then we'll solve for those arbitrary constants so that it is equal to the initial position. And in that way, given an acceleration, initial velocity, and initial position, we can find the position trajectory. So let's do an example. Suppose you throw a ball. Its initial position is 0, 0,6. And if you're throwing it from an initial position of 6 feet high, and as it leaves your fingers and feet. And you throw it with velocity 12 comma 5. So that means that for every 12 move, uh, feet it moves away from you, it moves 5 feet up, at least according to the initial velocity. However, gravity exists, and the downward accelerative force on the object due to gravity, or downward acceleration on the object due to gravity is 0 comma minus 32 feet per second squared. And indeed, gravity. Earth's gravity accelerates things downward at 32 feet per second squared. So first, let's find its initial speed. So the initial speed, that would be the magnitude of the initial velocity. That is the magnitude of 12 comma 5, which is the square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared is the square root of 169 is 13 feet per second if we care about units. OK, so that's its initial speed. Now let's find its velocity as a function of time. So this is where we'll be needing to use 
this aspect. So to find velocity, we'll need to integrate acceleration since the derivative of velocity is, is acceleration. But when we integrate, we'll have arbitrary constants. And then we'll need to solve for those arbitrary constants given our knowledge of the initial velocity. So we know that velocity as a function of time is the integral of acceleration. We know that acceleration, well, we were told it, it's 0, 32. So the integral of that dt, we integrate component-wise, and we get an arbitrary constant. Integral of 0 is a constant. Integral of minus 32 is minus 32t plus an arbitrary constant. That's not necessarily the same as the first one. Now, we need to solve for those arbitrary constants, given our particular initial velocity. So what else do we know? We know that v of 0, the initial velocity, is 12, 5. So thus, we know that v of 0, well, we know it's c1 plus, well, just c1, comma, minus 32, plugging in 0, that's times 0 plus C2, and that must be equal to 12 comma 5. So therefore, those components must be equal. C1 is 12, and C2 is 5. So we get that our velocity as a function of time is 12 comma minus 32 t plus 5. So again, the method was velocity is the integral of acceleration. Integrating will have arbitrary constants. We solve for those by plugging in 0 into this velocity function and setting it equal to know to what we're told the initial velocity is. And in that way, we can then equate coefficients and solve for what those arbitrary constants are when they're restricted to what we know our initial velocity is. OK, now that we know its velocity is a function of time, we found it was this. Yeah, same thing. Let's find its position. OK, so we know that position, that is the integral of velocity. We follow the exact same formula that we just did. That's the integral of 12, 5 minus 32t dt. Integral of 12 is 12t plus c1. Integral of 5 minus 32t is 5t minus 16t squared plus c2. Another arbitrary constant. And we know we're told that the initial position, s of 0, is 0, 6 in this case. So plugging that into this, we know that s of 0, plugging in 0 into this whole thing, our general position vector with unknown constants, that's 0 times t plus c1, comma, 5 times 0 minus 16 times 0 squared plus c2. And that must be equal to 0, comma, 6. So equating coefficients, we know that c1 is 0 and c2 is 6, since those guys go away. So therefore, our position vector of a function of time, of the ball that we have thrown, is 
12p plus 0. Just to be clear, I write that plus 0, but of course, in practice, we can omit it, comma, 5t minus 16t squared plus 6. Okay, so this type of thing is a common thing that you'll need to do on the homework and exams naturally. And hopefully I've presented it in a reason, reasonably formulaic way that makes sense. And from this, so we found its position vector is this. That's just rewriting what we found here in a different order. Then we can answer questions like, how long until the object hits the ground? Well, the ground, that means the x-axis, and that means that y is 0. So the y-coordinate being 0, that means that we want to set this guy equal to 0 to find the time t at which its height is 0. So what we want to do is solve. 6 plus 5t minus 16t squared is 0. And that's just the quadratic formula. I'm not going to go through that. And what we get is that x, or rather t, is equal to negative 0.47 or eight rounding, or 0 0.79 rounding. This guy, we can throw it away. There is no negative time here. Time zero begins when you throw the ball. So, it so therefore after 0 0.79 seconds the ball hits the ground and from what we found we can also find its maximum height okay so one slick way to do this so imagine our trajectory. The maximum height occurs when the x coordinate velocity pardon, occurs when the y coordinate velocity is equal to zero. So at this maximum height, then its velocity in the upward or downward direction is zero. So it occurs where the y velocity equals zero. Well, we know that the velocity, as we found, or taking the derivative of this, is 12 comma 5 minus 32t. So by this picture up here, at the maximum height, it's not moving up or down. It's going just horizontally. So we want to set this equal to 0 to find where the, the, the time at which the maximal height occurs. So 5 minus 32t is 0. That implies that the maximum height occurs at t equals 5 over 32. OK, but the problem didn't ask in this case, at what time does it reach its maximum height? It asked, what is its maximum height? 
So we need to plug that back into position. The position at the time at which it is at its maximum height, that is, okay, and this guy here, that is the y value, the height. So that is the height at the time that it reaches its maximum height. So the max height is, so we just compute that and we get about 6.39 feet. All right, so a number of problems on this section's homework are involved going through all of these steps, entering answers along the way to solve problems like this just from the initial position, initial velocity, and the acceleration vector. Okay, and the book does give this general formula, but this whole general formula, don't memorize it, it's ugly. It's much easier to just go through the steps, and the steps become quick and intuitive once you get the hang of them. And this vector approach is more general. So what we just did is was in two dimensions, but it also applies in three dimensions. So for example, if you hit a golf ball and there's a crosswind, then that crosswind induces a horizontal acceleration on the golf ball in addition to the gravitational force accelerating it downward. And the acceleration vector that you would begin with, and that's constant throughout, is the sum of the gravitational and crosswind acceleration vectors. So let's do an example. This will be our last one. Suppose that you knock a golf ball up with initial velocity 50, 40, 0 feet per second from position 0, the origin. And gravity and wind causes it to accelerate at 0, 8, minus 32 feet per second squared. So at minus 32, that's in the z coordinate, that's a downward acceleration from gravity. And that 8, that's in the y coordinate, in this case north, we're not using those numbers, and that is a horizontal acceleration. Let's find its position as a function of time. Okay, so first we know that in general velocity is the integral of acceleration. We need to begin with finding velocity because position is the integral of velocity and we can't find that without first finding velocity. Okay, acceleration, that's the constant vector. So I should note that oh, it, it does imply that that acceleration is constant. So throughout any t, so that is the integral of zero comma eight comma minus 32 dt. And that is C1 comma 8 T C2 plus C2 comma minus 32 T plus C3. Now let me note, by the way, that in general, and I think I'll be doing this later in the class just to expedite things, we can write that as 0 comma 8t comma minus 32t plus c1 c2 c3 and we'll typically denote this guy as just our constant vector c. So we can also think of this whole thing as solving for the constant vector at each stage. Okay and we know so for the sake of illustration Let's do it this way. We know that v of zero, the initial velocity is 50 comma 40 comma zero. We plug that in and v of zero 
that's 0 comma 8 times 0 comma minus 32 times 0 plus our arbitrary constant, this whole guy. And v of 0 is itself 50 comma 40 comma 0. Okay, this whole guy is the 0 vector. Everything is 0 there. So therefore, our constant vector is 50 comma 40 comma 0. So v of t is adding these together. That's 0 plus 50. We found that that c1 is 50, c2 is 40, c3 is 0. OK, so 50 comma 8t plus 40 comma minus 32t plus 0. OK, that's not our final answer. That was just the velocity. What we want is the position. So now that we have velocity, we can integrate it and find the position. So we know that position is the integral of velocity, which is the integral of what we just found, 50 comma 8t plus 40 comma minus 32t dt. OK, and that is 50t comma 4t squared plus 40t. I know it looks like I'm missing the plus the c1, c2, c3. For the sake of illustration in this example, let's put those out here, plus an arbitrary constant. So these guys are the components of the indefinite integrals without that arbitrary constant. And I put the arbitrary constant vector out here, which accounts for the arbitrary constants for all three. OK, and we know that its initial position, S of 0, it tells us is 0. OK, this guy is saying that its initial position is 0. So plugging in S of 0, that's 50 times 0, comma 4 times 0 squared plus 40 times 0, comma minus 16 times 0 squared plus C must be equal to our initial position of 0. OK, well, that's 0 plus C is the 0 vector. And that implies that our arbitrary vector there is itself 0. So this whole guy we found is the 0 vector. So our position as a function of time is just 50t comma 4t squared plus 40t comma minus 16t squared plus nothing, and we are done. All right. That concludes this 14.3 lecture and have a great one.